on this call that related gap measures and reconciliations are available in today's quarterly shareholder letter. With that, let me call, let me turn the call over to Jared. Jared? Hey, thanks, Tom. Uh, so if you've already reviewed our earnings letter, then you already know this was a very busy quarter and there's an awful lot for us to discuss today. Uh, so we wrapped up a strategic review. We continued to win some of the most coveted enterprise merchants. We added thousands of new SkyTap customers. We cross-sold ticketing to our numerous stadium wins, and we announced a synergy-rich and very attractively priced acquisition, alongside continuing our geographic expansion and delivering reasonably strong results uh, and record-free cash flow. So I think the only thing we probably could have done better is help analysts uh, capture the right seasonal cadence of our business. We're obviously diversifying and growing very quickly. Uh, so to help with that, we have largely reaffirmed and positively revised uh, our EBITDA and free cash flow guidance, and we broke it out on a quarterly basis for the balance of the year. So I just said a lot, um, and I'd like to break it down and expand on it point by point. So with respect to the strategic review, I would encourage you to read my shareholder letter if you'd like my complete personal take on the matter. But the bottom line is there was a lot of strategic interest and multiple formal offers materially higher than our present trading price. It should also be obvious that a go-private option is usually available, and others have clearly shown that to be the case. Uh, however, the go-private option presents clear complexities alongside a competing strategic offers. And I, of course, always want my interests to be completely aligned with the rest of my fellow shareholders. So now, as the strategic review process progressed, we continue to record some very big wins. And as a result, our price expectations rightfully kept going up. And I imagine, after uh, reviewing this quarter shareholder presentation, it will be even more obvious why we could never accept an offer that didn't properly value the trajectory of the business. So on that note, we did deliver some very big wins. Uh, I will go over the full list by vertical shortly, but we signed one of the uh, single largest casino properties in the world, which is Foxwoods, alongside developing a major partnership with one of the largest casino operators in the world. And we'll talk more about that soon, and we have many more to follow. Our SkyTab growth further accelerated with nearly 9,400 system installs in Q1, which represents a 38% increase quarter over quarter. We have continued momentum in our sports and entertainment vertical, including notable stadium and ticketing wins for the NFL world champions, the Kansas City Chiefs. We also announced uh, this quarter the acquisition of Rebel, uh, which I'll speak to a bit later in the prepared remarks. We followed our very important strategic customer into several new uh, international markets, including Albania, Mongolia, and soon in several African countries, Fiji and the Maldives. And the associated results from all of this met our expectations and set the stage very well for the balance of the year. So we generated 50% growth in end-to-end -end payment volume, 27% growth in gross profit, and 32% growth in gross revenue less network fees. We also generated 122 million of adjusted EBITDA, representing 36% year-over-year growth, as our margins expanded 150 basis points to 46% versus the corresponding year ago quarter. Our operating margins expanded despite the margin drag from the acquisitions of Appetize and Fenaro, both of which negatively impacted our margins by nearly 300 basis points for the quarter. Naturally, as synergies are realized, we expect that drag to disappear and contribute to our ongoing margin expansion targets. Perhaps most importantly, we generated 78.2 million of adjusted free cash flow, which is up 34% versus a year ago. Our blended spreads also remain stable coming in at approximately 62 basis points despite considerable volume growth. As mentioned earlier, an area we can, uh, of which we can improve is helping the analyst community better model the seasonal cadence of our business. Q1 typically represents the seasonally slowest quarter of the year, and 2024 has followed that pattern. Now, if you recall, uh, the Q1 of last year benefited from growing over an Omicron depressed Q1 of 2022. So that aside, we also know we are diversifying into many new verticals and growing quickly, which makes modeling challenging at times. So to help with that, we are providing quarterly guidance for the balance of the year to include positive revisions to EBITDA and free cash flow conversion. Our guidance does not include the recently announced acquisition, but does account for the accelerating organic growth that we have great visibility into, as well as expense discipline and efficiency gains. From here, I intend to provide the usual double click by vertical to include our progress internationally as well as more insights into our recent M&A activity. Now, starting with our core, which uh, as a reminder is composed primarily of restaurants, hotel, and specialty retail, once again contributed meaningfully to our growth. We are uniquely advantaged to win hotels and resorts with our 550 plus strong software integration library, including industry leading business intelligence tools and ever expanding geographic coverage. 
With restaurants, we have a very powerful and growing distribution network that includes both our direct sales team and authorized partners. We are advantaged uh, as we see really Toast and SkyTap uh, as the only modern cloud POS offerings capable of servicing uh, table service restaurants at scale. We further believe we have a more effective and lower cost development and go-to-market strategy, which in turn delivers a lower overall cost of service for our customers. Now, specifically with restaurants, we signed many notable brands to our platform and set new records with SkyTab installations. We signed chains such as Pizza Twist, a growing chain of Indian-inspired pizza with locations throughout the U.S. and Canada, Diverse Concepts, a professional restaurant management company with seven restaurant concepts, and Four Top Hospitality Group, a multi-concept independent restaurant group with 15 locations across the Southwest, Southeast. We also signed Grape Street uh, Cafe and Wine Bar with two locations in Las Vegas and Summerlin, Vessel, located in historic repurposed Lutheran Church in mid-city New Orleans, the infamous Hog Breath Saloon in Key West, Florida, and the award-winning Union League Cafe directly across the street from Yale University, which recently celebrated 30 years in business. In the U.S., our SkyTap production accelerated with approximately 9,400 system installs during the recent quarter. Our cloud-based, feature-rich rich and low-cost restaurant solution continues to resonate with restaurants. In April, we launched SkyTap Business Intelligence, uh, which is a reporting and analytics platform that is free to SkyTab POS customers. This follows the launch of our AI website builder last quarter. You know, we've released many modules as indicated in our shareholder presentation, and we don't charge for any of them. We don't believe there is a restaurant out there that is excited to pay POS companies for more modules and instead prefer a lower overall cost of service. So on that note, we believe our SkyTab POS offering uh, the mo offers the most compelling value proposition in the market with a total cost of ownership that is extremely competitive versus comparable solutions. At the current Q1 run rate, we are on pace to exceed our goal of 30,000 system installs of SkyTap for 2024. Now, outside the United States, our team is building awareness of the SkyTap US product in the United Kingdom and Ireland, and continues to sign up new restaurants, including Suvaki, located within London's West End, and within walking distance of the Prince Edward Theater. We also signed Ram's Restaurant, just outside of London's city limits. Further, we are, we are really excited to have been awarded the online ordering for Pizza Hut in Spain and Portugal. And these early international strides, organic product investments alongside our M&A strategy, inspires confidence in our goal to assign 10,000 new restaurant and hotel, hotel customers, specifically in Europe and Canada, before the year end. Now, turning to hotels, we had a record quarter of major signings. And as alluded to earlier in my prepared remarks, we developed a partnership with one of the largest casino operators in the world that we plan to speak to later this year, as well as signing one of the single largest casino properties in the world, the largest in North America, which is Foxwoods. We also signed Ho-Chuck Casino Hotel, a Native American hotel chain located in Wisconsin. In addition to these major casino wins, we had a record quarter of gateway conversions. We signed The Ranch at Rock Creek, which is a Montana-based five-star rated luxury spa and dude ranch. Sunseeker Resort on Florida's Gulf Coast, and Acme Hospitality, an operator of several hotels and multiple award-winning restaurants throughout California. We also signed Tropical Beach Resorts, a collection of boutique hotels in Siesta Key, the River Street Inn, located in Savannah's historic River Street, the Eddie Taproom and, Ho Tap Room and Hotel, which is a boutique hotel located in Golden, Colorado, Rosada H Hospitality, which is an upscale resort located in Central Oregon's Cascade Mountains, and Mohawk uh, Mountain House, a national historic landmark and resort located in the Hudson Valley of New York State. Our expansion into Canada is also going well, and we signed uh, hotels including the Halcyon Hot Springs Resort, which is a spa resort located in British uh, Columbia, Fairways Hotel on the mountain, which is a golf resort in the mountains of the capital city of Victoria, Coastal Hotels, which is an operator of multiple Canadian hotels, and the Lac Lungern uh, which is a uh, uh, hotel that's located on the shores of beautiful Lac, Lac Lejeune um, in Canada. In Europe, we also signed Leonardo Hotels, uh, which is a European, European brand with hundreds of locations throughout Europe and in the UK. And our business development pipeline for European hotel uh, prospects is building very, very quickly. Now in specialty retail, we signed Russell Stover, which just celebrated its 100th anniversary and Ledson Winery, which is a fifth generation family owned winery located in the heart of Sonoma Valley. We also expanded our relationship with Goodwill Industries and will serve as a primary payment processor for their three new Goodwill stores, which opened in Puerto Rico. In Europe, we entered into an agreement to process payments for online beauty retailer Lux Plus, 
uh, a card present payments provider uh, in Southern Europe's EV charging network, Aliante, and card acquiring services for the digital banking platform, One Money Way. We are also enabling merchants to accept digital wallets such as PayPal, Venmo, and Cash App in Europe through a partnership with FOSS. We entered into agreements to provide car, car, card acquiring services for Bravo Tours, uh, which is a Danish uh, online travel agent, uh, as well as Sweden's Dent Friends, which is a network of hundreds of dental clinics, and signed a partnership agreement with a couple of European PSPs, Pater and Fabric, which service merchants in the Netherlands, Italy, Spain, and the UK. Moving on to new verticals. Um, now, in sports and entertainment, we continue to add ticketing volume with our existing clients and successfully migrate appetized customers onto the Ship 4 Venue Next platform. So we were awarded ticketing uh, from the Kansas City Chiefs, the Chicago White Sox, and the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, now, the Vikings and White Sox represented uh, a ticketing upsell to an existing stadium customer. We also converted American Airlines Center, home of the Dallas Mavericks and Dallas Stars, to our platform and signed University of Oklahoma, University of Utah, and the University of Nebraska, the last of which we will also be powering uh, ticketing for via our partnership with Pat Yolen. We also recently hosted an investor event at Yankee Stadium, highlighting one of our largest venue next installations that was also a conversion from Appetize. We signed payment processing agreements with several convention centers, including the Boston Convention Center, all of which were legacy Appetize customers. Now in minor league baseball, we entered a ticket into ticketing and concession deals with 10 additional minor league baseball stadiums, increasing our total roster to approximately 60 minor league baseball, te baseball teams that are Shift 4 customers. And we are really excited to announce two European stadium wins, including the famous FC Barcelona alongside Exeter City. Um, and our strategic partnership with uh, FC Barcelona includes deploying a cons comprehensive technology and payment stack to their iconic new stadium, Spotify uh, Camp Nou. I often uh, remind investors when we are asked about the organic growth profile of the business or revenue acceleration to think about literally the dozens of major wins that uh, I just talked about just now alongside every other quarter. I mean, we are literally powering the best experiences at the coolest venues from the Super Bowl to the Rolling Stones. And these caliber of merchants are not selecting shift four because we were somehow a fraction of a penny less expensive. It's because the commerce enabling solution we are providing is the best fit for their business. So continuing on with new verticals to nonprofits, uh, the first quarter should actually be uh, a seasonal low. But we are in fact seeing uh, the giving block transaction volume and donations up quarter over quarter, uh, which we estimate will lead to year over year growth in excess of 400%. We entered into inspiring collaboration with Cabrini Mission Foundation to power um, meaningful change through crypto philanthropy. The Cabrini Mission Foundation embodies the spirit of St. Francis Xavier Cabrini the patron saint of immigrants, and her story continues to resonate notably on the big screen. We've taken our first steps with key integration partners such as Give and Gain and Give Lively. These integrations and others uh, to come will dwarf our efforts to process for individual nonprofits, unlocking opportunities to process for tens of thousands of charities. Outside of direct relationships with major, major organizations like St. Jude, these integration partnerships uh, will be the drivers of our success in the nonprofit sector. So beyond traditional credit card and crypto volume, we also continue to make tremendous progress growing our market share, uh, processing alternative donation methods for nonprofit organizations via the giving box, such as stocks and donor advisory fund grants. This quarter, we signed large charities like the Jewish Community Foundation, the Catholic Charity Fund, and expanded our relationship with the American Heart Association. In other new verticals like travel, gaming, and sexy tech, we signed Grand Canyon Airlines, the oldest aerial tour operator providing sightseeing tours for the Grand Canyon. In gaming, we are now live with SkyTab mobile devices at our first BetMGM Sportsbook locations, National Stadium in Washington, D.C., and next month we will be live at the Cincinnati Red Stadium. We expect to be live in all 24 BetMGM Sportsbook locations across nine states by the end of this year. SkyTab devices are also being integrated with Passport technology to enable various cashless gaming experiences on the casino floor at casinos such as the Morongo Casino outside of Palm Springs. Separately, we signed several new online gaming clients during the quarter, including launching more states with Lotto.com in Nebraska, Florida, and Arizona for state lottery. Uh, we signed Prime uh, Sports Betting, an online sports betting platform currently operating in Ohio, New Jersey, and Kentucky. Uh, and Kentucky is actually soon to follow. And lastly, 1010 Gaming, an online gaming and sweep, sweepstakes site blending social media with slot and casino type games. We also went live with Rolling Riches uh, during the quarter, which is now live processing on Shift 4. 
In Sexy Tech, we teamed up with unified uh, business to business commerce platform Peppery to offer buyers on their platform a more efficient and convenient way to pay. Peppery powers the front and back office for over 1,000 B2B e commerce merchants in over 70 countries. We signed a payment processing agreement with VinSeeker, which provides consumers and businesses the most comprehensive vehicle history reports in the industry. Perhaps most exciting, we can continue to grow volume very quickly with our large strategic e-commerce customer and have organically expanded into several new countries that I mentioned earlier. We've also built on our various domestic and international EV partnerships, including an undisclosed but personally a very special collaboration to support new restaurant concepts at EV charging locations. Now internationally, uh, as mentioned throughout our call, we are executing on our strategy to follow our important strategic customer all over the world and then bring all the products and integrations and services into those markets that made us so successful in the USA. We have signed notable restaurants, hotels, e-commerce, and sexy tech providers all over Europe and even into Canada. We feel confident we are well on our way to achieving our 2024 goal of 10,000 restaurants and hotels signed in just international markets in addition to the 30,000 systems goal we are on pace to exceed in the USA. Now, uh, with respect to M&A, to accelerate our growth, especially in the restaurant vertical and international markets, we've announced a really exciting acquisition of Revel this quarter. This deal very much follows our playbook of achieving a lower customer acquisition cost, enhancing distribution to accelerate growth in a core vertical, alongside talent and other synergies. And Taylor will go over this further in just a bit. So in closing, um, you know, for those familiar with the Shift 4 story over the last few years, it's probably not much of a surprise that we've been frustrated from time to time with the lack of appreciation in the public markets. You know, it seems like we are always battling one theory after the next to try and explain away our outperformance. And at times, it feels our competitors always get the benefit of the doubt, be that the fastest growing single vertical players that lack our diversification or profitability profile, or the slower growing competitors that ran out of good ideas, uh, or those that will go private at a two or three turn EBITDA premium to our present valuation. Meanwhile, we have the best customers in the most desirable verticals, growing faster than just about anyone else and riding several advantages that make it easier and more affordable for us to win while constantly improving the profitability profile of the business. To put a finer point on it, we've grown EBITDA 7X since our IPO, and yet Shift4 is only 1.6 times more valuable, all while being more diversified and with a much better economic backdrop than a global pandemic. And on that note, I don't know why the long-term weighing machine hasn't quite kicked in yet, but I do believe those that continue to bet against us are going to quickly be running out of stories to tell as ultimately performance and especially free cash flow prevail. Finally, if you only follow us through earnings, you may think we love celebrating all our wins, and I certainly read a lot of them on this call. That actually couldn't be further from the truth. We are obligated, maybe more so than many other companies, to promote and defend our accomplishments. But day to day and in the boardroom, I can assure you, we spend all of our time on the things we don't do well, our shortcomings and inefficiencies. In fact, I believe it's our relentless focus on our inadequacies that fuels so much of our momentum. All of our employees know this, and we need to embrace ownership, challenge the status quo, delete old and costly parts, proceduralize, and automate to the extent possible, and always execute with urgency. That is the shift for way. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to Taylor. Thank you, Jared, and good morning, everyone. <clears throat> the current operating environment is reasonably favorable for us. While we began the year with some headwinds in same-store sales, merchants exited the quarter roughly flat on same-store sales from a year ago. Merchants also continue to seek out technology that helps streamline the commerce experience. The persistent uncertainty around consumer spending actually helps steer, steer them towards solutions like ours, which eliminate multiple vendors and help save money. We are also advantaged from a capital perspective and can invest in our business at a time when many competitors are pulling back. I'll talk more about how we're allocating capital in a moment. We spent much of Q1 focused on M&A integration. As seen in our recent press releases and earnings material, our approach to sports and entertainment is resonating well with appetized customers. As Jared mentioned, we recently had the opportunity to host investors at a Yankees game, which was a former appetized customer and is now using our venue next technology and ship for payments throughout the state. Our ability to deliver world-class technology into complex environments quickly and in a way that delivers meaningful value for our merchants is just one of the reasons we move decisively when M&A opportunities like this present themselves. Similarly, the Finero business is now operationally and technically integrated into Ship4. You will find numerous examples of European restaurants, hotels, and stadiums who have recently chosen Ship4 in our earnings material, 
all of which would not be possible without the capabilities brought to us via the Panero acquisition. Contrary to popular myths, these integrations do not distract from our ability to continue to seek out new growth opportunities. When M&A is done right, everyone knows the playbook from the day of closing and is working expeditiously to achieve combined goals. This includes unlocking revenue synergies, deleting unnecessary parts, and repurposing personnel, which is evidenced by the margin expansion we've delivered while investing in the business. In that theme, we also continued to invest in our SkyTab product and payment platform and added thousands of new merchants ranging from SMBs to the largest hospitality enterprises in the quarter. This combination of winning products, a large distribution network, economic advantages, and volatile capital markets continues to create excellent capital allocation opportunities for us. As a reminder, we generally allocate capital across four major priorities, product innovation, customer acquisition, share repurchases, and M&A, which can dramatically accelerate our strategy as noted previously with the acquisition of Appetize. In our shareholder letter this morning, we laid out this framework along with our growth capital deployed over the last five years. Note that this strategy has resulted in adjusted EBITDA growing sevenfold over the last five years, as Jared mentioned earlier. While we are proud of our track record, we also recognize that our work is never done. We will spend, uh, and we'll spend a few minutes on how we are positioning ourselves for the year and years ahead. To be frank, we see more interesting capital allocation opportunities than we could reasonably pursue, which is a really fun challenge. There is still much work to be done in delivering our products across Europe and the rest of the world. Our M&A pipeline is full of compelling opportunities in every flavor we like, capability and geography enhancements, low customer acquisition costs, take out the parts, et cetera. We also can't ignore our equity as one of the easiest investments we can make at current trading multiples. In that vein, you will see we announced our intention to acquire Revel POS for $250 million this morning. And while I can't comment at length, given a few steps we need to complete before closing, this is a playbook we execute very well and we're excited to talk about our plans for the business. Should the transaction close by July 1st, we would anticipate a roughly $15 million EBITDA contribution during the remainder of the year and a more substantial EBITDA growth in 2025. But of course, we will update you uh, all again when the transaction closes. In terms of other capital allocation priorities, our strategic review and M&A have prevented us from being an active buyer of our equity in recent quarters, which has been frustrating. Uh, similar to 2021 and 2022, we see our equity as highly attractive at current multiples and have announced a larger $500 million repurchase authorization as a result and are implementing an ongoing repurchase plan to take advantage of the dislocation in our equity value. As always, you should expect us to balance this with the priorities I mentioned previously and also leverage and also our leverage profile so as to maintain short, medium, and long-term profitable growth and free cash flow generation. And with that, I'll turn the call over to Nancy to discuss our financial results. Thanks, Taylor, and good morning, everyone. We delivered another quarter of solid results in line with our expectations, demonstrating again our ability to deliver top-line growth while continuing to drive margin expansion and strong free cash flow conversion. Total Q1 volume of 33 billion grew 50% year over year. Gross revenue less network fees grew 32% to 264 million. Our adjusted EBITDA for the quarter was 122 million, up 36%, and adjusted EBITDA margins were 46%. Excluding the impact of the legacy Panaro and Appetite businesses, margins expanded nearly 450 basis points. Our quarterly results were driven by the continued strength of our hospitality and restaurant verticals, momentum across our enterprise merchants, including new verticals, further monetization and conversions of gateway customers, and increasingly large contribution from stadiums and ticketing. The blended spread for the first quarter was 62 basis points, in line with our expectations and consistent with our full year guidance for spreads to average 60 basis points. While the evolution of our business has been significant since the IPO, and certainly over the last 12 to 18 months, as we have moved up market and diversified our verticals, we believe we are approaching a floor of 60 basis points that we expect to hold for the balance of the year. Any deviation from this will likely be a function of volume outperformance. It is worth noting that the spreads across our core business of restaurant, restaurant hospitality and special, specialty retail remain stable. Gateway revenue decreased sequentially in the quarter, reflecting the continued success of our Gateway Sunset initiative. The remaining Gateway conversion population currently represents less than three basis points of spread. This highlights the magnitude of the remaining opportunity ahead of us. Subscription and other revenue in Q1 was up 45% compared to the same period last year, 
driven in part by the success we are having in sports and entertainment and with SkyTab and the restaurant vertical overall. Restaurant SaaS was up 55%. In total, you'll see that Q1 subscription and other revenue of 52 million was down sequentially from Q4, reflecting our continued success of converting appetized and software-only clients to acquiring and the timing of one-time hardware revenue. This also serves as a good opportunity to remind investors that we often blow up the legacy revenue model of our acquisitions and pivot them towards our signature shift work payments fueled value proposition. In Q1, total general and administrative expenses increased 25% year over year to 107 million, driven by the impact of the acquisitions completed in Q4. We remain highly committed to a disciplined approach to cost management while continuing strategic investment for growth. Our goal of keeping overall headcount flat while investing in talent, talent upgrades remains in place. We are quickly progressing on the overhaul of our operating model, which will further drive efficiency and scalability across our platform. platform. As a reminder, stock-based compensation expense of 23 million is higher in Q1 than other quarters, as has been customary due to the timing of our, of our annual awards. Our first quarter adjusted EBITDA margins were 46%, representing over 150 basis points of expansion compared to Q1 2023. As I previously just mentioned, but, but worth saying again, excluding the impact of acquisitions, margins actually expanded nearly 450 basis points. We have high conviction on the many opportunities to further improve margins that are still on the horizon, including remaining M&A synergies, utilization of AI technology, implementation of new internal systems, and the ongoing streamlining efforts to enhance scalability throughout our business operations. Our adjusted free cash flow in the quarter was 78 million, representing an adjusted free cash flow conversion of 64%, well above our current full year guidance. As a reminder, there will be fluctuations in our conversion rates on a quarterly basis due to the seasonality of our business, the timing of interest payments, and the deployment of capital to support growth. But the improvement in our unit economics and operating model give us confidence in our ability to deliver annual year over year expansion in our conversion rate. Net income was 28.5 million for the first quarter. Diluted earnings per class A and class C share was 31 cents. Adjusted net income for the quarter was 50.5 million or 54 cents per A and C share on a diluted basis on a 93 million average fully diluted shares outstanding. Our balance sheet remains strong. And as of the end of the quarter, we have approximately 700 million of available liquidity. Our total indebtedness has a weighted average cost of 1.35% and we do not have any maturities until December, 2025. Our net leverage at quarter M was approximately 2.4 times. Our strong balance sheet, growing EBITDA and expanding free cash flow afford us many options to fund strategic priorities, opportunistically buy back stock and satisfy year end 2025 maturities without being punitive to our equity. Now turning to guidance for full year 2024, we are tightening our guidance range for end-to-end -end volume and now expect a range of 167 billion to 175 billion, representing 53% to 61% year-over-year growth. We are also increasing the low end of our adjusted EBITDA range and now expect adjusted EBITDA to be in the range of 640 million to 675 million, representing 72 basis points of year-over-year -year margin expansion at the midpoint which includes the drag from acquisitions. We are also increasing our adjusted free cash flow conversion expectation to 60% from 58% previously, which yields 395 million of adjusted free cash flow for full year 2024 at the midpoint of our adjusted EBITDA guidance. Our expectations for gross revenue less network fees remain unchanged. And as mentioned on our last earnings call, we expect organic growth of gross revenue less network fees to be north of 25%. We are also providing a quarterly breakdown of our annual guidance to help investors better understand the impact of seasonality on our business, which can be found on page 19 of our shareholder letter. A couple of call outs as it pertains to our guidance. We continue to expect a stronger second half in 2024 due to factors I will elabor elaborate on in a minute. And secondly, our full year and quarterly guidance do not include any contribution from Revel. Once we receive the customary approvals, we will update our guidance at that time. There are several things to note relating to our guide. First, I would like to highlight several initiatives that contribute to growth accelerating through the back half of the year. 
While most of these points should be obvious by simply reviewing the numerous wins featured each quarter, it is worth emphasizing. SkyTab system installs continue to accelerate each quarter, and we are ahead of schedule on our 30,000 goal for 2024. Many of the wins featured each quarter, especially stadiums and, their, and, and related ticketing opportunities, major enterprise resorts go live several quarters after the announcement. We are particularly fortunate to have won several multi-billion dollar opportunities in the hospitality industry that we expect to contribute meaningfully to the back half of this year. 2024 marks the first year we are really able to offer our services in Canada and across Europe and early traction in both hotels and restaurants, including, including this quarter's Leonardo Hotels announcement, are confidence inspiring. Our strategic e-commerce customer continues to add volume quickly, and we have been expanding organically into several new international markets that Jared discussed with strong visibility into the back half of the year. The low end of our guide contemplates modest headwinds in consumer spending, during which we are confident we can continue to deliver best-in-class growth among our peer set. On that note, it's worth pointing out that we have been very pleased with same-store sale recovery data we have observed in April. Next, the high end of our guide implies a continuation of recent trends in both our growth and consumer spending, as well as several appropriately weighted international expansion initiatives. And finally, while the midpoint of our guide implies modest margin expansion, excluding the impact of legacy scenario and appetite, margins are expanding meaningfully in 2024. And to reiterate, the impact of Revel is not included in the guide. Before turning the call back to Jared, I want to reiterate that our balance sheet, cash generation, and profitable growth position us incredibly well for the current environment of macro uncertainty. With that, let me now turn the call back to Jared. Thanks, Nancy. Okay, this was, um, this was a long one. Um, so uh, a lot of ground covered, a lot of good wins. Before we go to uh, the analyst Q&A, we did say we were gonna select uh, one or two questions from, our, uh, from X. So first one's from Jared Block. From one Jared to another, uh, why did a deal not close to be acquired? Was it valuation? Do you see that a possible acquisition could happen in the near future? Um, Jared, thanks for the question. I mean, this is really what I dedicated my whole kind of opening letter to in the shareholder note. I tried to give like the full play by play. Um, you know, there was a lot of strategic interest and once you have strategic interest, that means, you know, really anything from like a go private perspective has to be sidelined. And, um, and I think, look, rightfully, price expectations kept going up because we knew all about these wins. And, you know, the market reacted the way they did over the last month. Analyst notes come out the way they do, indicating potential price ranges. And that's what a, a good independent board and special committee looks at uh, to make determinations. Do I see a possible acquisition in the future? Look, I mean, part of my letter was to say, like, we're, we're very focused on our executing on our plan. We outlined our plan and the associated results. That said, long term. I mentioned like I, I don't see my grandkids running a payments business someday. The idea is to make so many problems and create so much frustration for our competition that at some point they make the problem go away. I have no idea what that, that time frame will look like. Uh, also, just hitting real quick, Nate, quickly, uh, Krishna and Mohammed, I think this is like the third quarter in the row in, in a row that we've taken one of your questions, uh, but you have good ones. So uh, how has the expansion outside of North America been progressing? Stadium, sky tabs, et cetera. Has Shift 4 been able to execute its playbook as expected? Are you facing any significant challenges during the expansion? Um, look, hey, I, I mean, I don't know. We probably rattled off like 100 names uh, this quarter, uh, which for everyone's awareness is not the uh, complete list of our wins for the quarter, even though it may have sounded like it, um, including a number in Canada uh, and Europe, which we've never talked about before because we never could. I mean, I, I draw attention specifically to Leonardo Hotels. Hotels. I mean, that's several hundred locations um, I mean, that's a fantastic proof point, but we, we listed hotels in Canada, um, of which we had billions, uh, we have billions of gateway volume in Canada that we've never been able to pursue up until this past uh, quarter or two. So I'd say traction's great, SkyTab is going really well. Um, really, we, we put in some, uh, into our guide, we put some investments in around, you know, the middle of the year to kind of ramp up some of our, uh, some of our distribution across Europe, because this is really gonna be just a distribution game. Um, you know, how we go out, how we go to market to get SkyTab in front of a lot of restaurants. But we are able to have immediate impact just from the hundreds of third party integrations we have that already accounted for the European market, whether that's Micros or, you know, Oracle, Microsoft, Agilisys, we're able to kind of hit the ground running pretty quick there. So all in all, uh, pretty happy with our international uh, expansion right now. So thanks for the, thanks for those two questions from X and we will go to uh, the analyst. Thank you. If you would like to ask a question, 
please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. A confirmation tone will indicate your line is in the question queue. You may press star 2 if you would like to remove your question from the queue. For participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing the star keys. Our first question today comes from Darren Peller of Wolf Research. Please proceed with your question. Hey guys, thanks. Jared, thanks for all the uh, color on the uh, strategic review update. But look, with, with regard to growth and the guidance, obviously it's great to see the wins you're having. It sounds, Nancy, it sounded to me like you, that was the driving force of the conviction in the ramp, was all the new wins you had. And those ramping as the year progresses combined, I guess, with SkyTap success. Um, maybe just reiterate, is, that, is there how much conservatism do you have in understanding that the implementations are going to be timed appropriately? No, there's no, is there room for timing changes or anything embedded in the outlook? And then um, maybe just what the actual contribution is from new business versus the original guide you gave on that roadmap on volume would be helpful. And then a quick one on just organic. I'm assuming it's still in the 20% plus or mid-20s, like you, you know, as, as it would be, but if you can comment on the first quarter. Yeah, I mean, I'll start and certainly these guys could jump in, but uh, I'll reiterate really what was in my prepared remarks. We absolutely are still reaffirming that we expect organic growth to be more than 25% on a full year basis. And yes, there's definitely acceleration in that through the year, but you know, Q1 was um, really right in line and very strong. Um, I think when we think about all the things Jared just said, every one of them is certainly quantified um, you know, to an Excel level that you would expect. Um, so they're not just words on the page, right? So when we think about the acceleration into the back half, there's a lot of detail behind that. And I think that we, you, know, you start with SkyTab, right? And let the success, the success we're having toward the 30,000 goal, right? Totally on track and, and measurable. Uh, the featured wins that we talked about, I don't think we spent as much time today, but you know, the ticketing wins, you, you know how that works, right? It's just additive and flow through. And that's where you see our, you know, incredible positivity around um, upping the guide on EBITDA and free cash flow, right? You know, that whole unit economic and what we've been talking about for the past, you know, 12 months, it's really coming to fruition as you see these go lives, you know, quarter after quarter. And yes, of course, they're timed around certain seasons and so forth with, with the teams. You know, as we think about hospitality and in, and moving forward um, with, with hospitality in Europe and Canada, those wins are happening, right? You know, two quarters ago, we weren't able to actually bring those on, right? So now those are boarding and live and ramping um, and absolutely contributing into the back half. And, you know, I think just as you think about, I know Jared talked about the strategic e-commerce customer, right? Like that's something that is a little bit, you know, we time it and it can move just like um, some of these enterprise launches that we have can move. So so we're, we're always going to have that mix issue that we could have a delay because of installs, but our line of sight has always been pretty good. And so I think that's why our, we've had we've have high conviction around the ramp and it's it's not different than what we planned when we gave our original guide. Yeah, and Darren, if Jared here, just to kind of weigh in uh, on, the, on those points a little bit more. I mean, first in, in trying to break things out on a, on a quarterly basis, I mean, simply put, like we wouldn't do it uh, unless we had uh, pretty high confidence in it. Um, you know, we're, uh, we're, <laughs> We're, we're a pretty motivated organization. We like we like posting wins every quarter. So if things are, are off the cadence that we believe is is likely, we want to correct it and set the set the proper cadence for the year. Uh, so I'd say that that should be a sign of confidence. In terms of ramp for the the back half, to, to Nancy's point, yeah, it's it, it's everything you list out in in this quarter's you know like earnings report, and probably many of the prior quarters as well, like the last two or three. Yeah. I, I, it's just not instantaneous, right? Like I, I almost liken it to like. Uh, a manufacturing backlog, right? Like maybe we should look at talking about like how much uh, in terms of billions uh, of volume of backlog is waiting for installation because we've been posting, you know, stadium wins and ticketing wins for several quarters now. And some of them, they might say the go live is June of, uh, you know, 2024, um, things of that nature. BAI Hotel is the cover of our, our earnings report like a year and a half ago, it hasn't opened yet. Um, so the point is, is, is as that backlog continues to grow, you know, you can get, you can actually like forecast it out with a degree of margin greater uh, than you would have previously. And, and the last thing I just say on the, your question on the organic side, and Nancy mentioned it in her remarks about blowing up the revenue model. I don't think any like people like really appreciate the lengths that we will go uh, to like wreck uh, the, re you know, a, a failed revenue model of an acquisition in order to pivot in the right direction. Like we've said this before on at the, around the appetite time, but like we will absolutely give freebies away on their, you know, SaaS fees for a year or their hardware fees a year, things that were part of their historic business or revenue at the time we acquired, just to move them over to our new product mm -hmm. so we can delete parts and monetize through payments. So like, 
it's, I know that's very tricky for, for analysts to like get their arms around unless we like really itemize it out. But like you should assume most of the acquisitions we've done have intentionally been set back from a, from a, from the legacy revenue perspective to move like five steps forward in our preferred direction. Yeah. yeah. That's great. So it sounds very bottoms up. So that's, that's really helpful. Just very quickly, international, it was great to see the wins, the stadiums, the hotels uh, on both sides. Um, just the progress you're having there seems like it's, it's truly happening. Any, what's your opportunity there in the near term? And then maybe, I mean, we know the long term is big, but is that, is that pipeline still continuing in the near term? Yeah. I mean, Darren, I can Jared here on this one. I, I think like, I, I didn't expect uh, last quarter to be able to talk about as many wins in uh, Europe and Canada this quarter. Um, I mean, we really just started. So, I mean, there were some pretty impressive yeah. wins in there. I know I, I rattled off a, you know, pretty long laundry list there, but we, we had some pretty big hotels, some pretty big operators. I mean, you, know, you got Pizza Hut in a couple countries. That's, that's pretty good uh, from an you know, online ordering perspective. We've had amazing traction with EV operators. Uh, so, yeah, I, I'd say in terms of like our, our plans for Europe and Canada, we're, we're ahead of where we thought we were, especially, uh, you know, a quarter or two ago. That's why we kind of mentioned, or I mentioned before, like we started making some investments and it's in our guide, you know, uh, towards the middle of this year, just to, just to ramp up some of our distribution firepower in Europe, because we think we'll need it. That's great, guys. Congrats. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Will Nance of Goldman Sachs. Please proceed with your question. Hey, guys. Uh, appreciate you taking the question. Uh, like I, I think the back half ramp and the guidance is kind of the the main focus this morning and just getting comfortable with it. Uh, I realize Darren just asked about this, but I guess, can you put a finer point on just what's different about this year from an implementation perspective from prior years? Because I, yeah, I think I'm getting to something like 56 to 57% of revenue in the back half, and it's been pretty, pretty consistently more like 54 to 55. And maybe the answer is just we've got a lot more of these chunky stadium and ticketing wins in the back half, but you know, I'm just wondering if you can kind of double click on, you know, what's sort of different about the implementation schedule this year versus in prior years, just to help people kind of get a better understanding for that. Yeah, well, I'll start and then, you know, invite, invite Taylor and Nancy to come in. I, I would really just call it that growing backlog of go lives. Um, you know, we have certainly been moving up market as demonstrated by like the average volume for merchant data. It's one of the slides that we, we periodically put in our earnings reports. We've been done nothing but like move up market and diversify into kind of more complex verticals like stadiums and, and e-commerce. And we just have really good visibility into, into go lives and they start stacking up. Um, you know, like I mentioned before, like there are certainly stadiums and hotels and resorts that we announced two quarters ago uh, that are in our backlog for, for go lives. And, and frankly, like the bigger the backlog grows, um, the more margin you have when you start forecasting out, you know, which is largely customer driven dates when, when they'll go live. So I think it's a, it's a big part of it is just the mix shift and the fact that the last couple of years being in these new verticals, um, you know, you just have more, you, you just have a greater sense of, uh, or greater visibility into when they'll turn on. Also, I mean, just from a seasonality perspective, like the football season, when they build a lot of ticketing, um, a lot of these are travel and leisure are more, um, you know, seasonally in play in the second half of the year. Nancy or Taylor. Uh, the, the one thing I would say just to kind of tack on because it's slight, slightly different topic is we are continuing to synergize um, prior acquisitions, right? So as we do that, those revenue synergies are, are, are happen, help, helping back half of the year. Also, our gateway uh, sunset initiative, um, it's, we, that's like a great example of where we have complete visibility of who's moving and when. So the, the process there will definitely help, you know, both from conversion monetization. Um, as you guys know, we talked about carrots moving slightly more to sticks and, and it's working. We're getting those conversions to end to end. So that I, I would say similar to ticketing, we have visibility to when those moves are going to happen. Got it. Appreciate all the helpful details. And just a follow-up, uh, actually, Nancy, on that last point, maybe just to rewind a little bit to last quarter. It sounded like there was a bit of a more unusual gateway uh, deal in prior quarter. And I'm just wondering if you could kind of update us on how that's impacting the numbers. And you mentioned the gateway revenue is coming down uh, sequentially this quarter again. And so just remind us about the process of getting the, the converted into in volume up to the, the kind of the standard net revenue take rates that we would typically expect in those deals. And maybe just some context for, you know, roughly, I guess, did it come on at significantly lower spreads initially? And just, I guess, what is that delta that you guys are closing over the course of, uh, yeah, I guess, the repapering of the franchisees? Yeah, sure. Actually, this is Taylor. I'll hit that, um, having been involved with the relationship. Um, you know, it, it's it's a dynamic that we described in detail last quarter, which is effectively that we've got, you know, um, 
a few different opportunities whereby we can contract with franchisees on a direct basis at a higher spread. Um, the, the way this represents itself in our financials is that we have end-to-end -end volume today that we would determine, we would uh, designate as kind of under monetized, meaning it's paying a lower spread. However, the, the way the relationship we expect to evolve is that we will be able to contract with the franchisees directly, provide them more services, et cetera. So again, it's a, uh, you know, Nancy alluded to the spread stability that we're starting to see. This is one area of comfort for us in that regard, which is effectively an institutional relationship where we can take on more of the burden for that large enterprise um, and contract with the franchisees at what are uh, closer to sort of small to medium sized businesses rates. Um, one level is spread, but it also takes a while to roll out. It's not something you can attack, you know, thousands of locations all at once with. Um, again, kind of alluding to, uh, you know, more activity from a revenue perspective in the back half of the year. Got it. So, so it is an in-year benefit, the repapering? It's not like a multi-year thing? I, you know, it's, it's as fast as we can get to thousands of locations. I don't want to be more specific than that. We try hard. Um, and it also gets, it also competes with, you know, net new business uh, from time to time. So. Yeah, got it. All right. I appreciate taking the questions, guys. The next question is from Timothy Chiato of UBS. Please proceed with your question. Great, thank you for taking the question. I want to touch on the 500 billion figure that's in the shareholder letter. It's the total under monetized end-to-end -end volume funnel. At the last update, I believe the gateway opportunity had about 120 billion left. Software was another 30. It was something you could just bridge us to the total 500 and just expand a little bit and elaborate around that pretty large end-to-end uh, -end funnel opportunity. Yeah, sure, so um, I'll, I'll hit this one as well. Um, you know, we put those two slides in there because there's been a lot of talk about capital allocation. How do we think about the dollars we deploy? Um, we, we believe it's a core competency of our business. It's a really strong differentiator. Um, and, and I think we're, we're actually quite agnostic in terms of how our dollars get allocated, be that, you know, product development, M&A, um, stock buybacks, um, you know, customer acquisition costs, et cetera, as long as the math uh, makes a ton, of, uh, a ton of fundamental sense. Um, and so we tried to illustrate kind of what our track record has been over the past few years in terms of total dollars deployed and what the opportunity that those dollars have presented um, it, it exists. So, you know, we've all cited the gateway regularly. That was a portion of that $500 billion, but every dollar we've deployed towards M&A opportunities and otherwise has, uh, has presented, uh, you know, a, a volume uh, base that we can go attack that hasn't monetized payments well. And I think we've called out things like Appetize and Focus Pause, all of those transactions had you know, volume that isn't quite as, um, as you know, daily measurable as the gateway volume, but it's an incredible opportunity. So we laid that out, um, I, you know, again, just to be very clear, you can consider our existing, um, you know, gateway population as a portion of that 500. You can consider appetized customers inside of that 500, et cetera. What's not inside of that is the transaction that we announced, uh, you know, in the page uh, just after that. Um, so we tried to give investors as a sense for why we allocate capital the way we do, what we look for when we deploy a dollar. Again, we are agnostic. Um, to whether that dollar is to hire an employee, to build a product, to buy another company, um, or to buy back our own stock, as long as the returns make a ton of sense. Um, and hopefully, you know, that gives investors some confidence that when they see us invest uh, dollars, uh, and we, we announced two interesting ones today in, in the form of Revel and a large stock buyback, they should be really excited um, that, you know, we found opportunities to meet those, those return objectives. Perfect. Thank you, Taylor. The brief, just a quick numbers one, if you're able to update, I know that last year or a few years back when you did the insourcing, there was the 350 direct sales force, and you, you likely had some other direct sales folks in-house, plus the resellers. So that was a U.S. number. Can you just, one, update the size of the distribution in the U.S., both direct and indirect, and then touch on where that sits for Europe in terms of how much hiring there has been for sales in Europe, and then how many of those distribution partners partners you have, which I recognize that you, you just mentioned them a few questions back, but if you could put some numbers to it, That'd be appreciated. Yeah, I'll, I'll actually start in reverse and let Jared cover the U.S. sales force. Um, you know, we've been spending a lot of time on the European opportunity. Our European sales force largely consists uh, today of the former Frenero sales team, plus uh, a handful of early stage software partners that we've had in the U.S. that also install systems uh, throughout Europe. And then a very small handful of incredibly talented folks that put up a disproportionate number of the wins you see in this earnings stack. We are by no means at the scale we'd like to be with regard to European distribution. We've got you know pretty strong and 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 uh, ambitious plans for our uh, our sales force in Europe, but it is by no means where we'd like it to be. Jared, do you want to comment on the U.S.? Yeah, I, I think from the time that we did uh, distribution and sourcing, so um, I guess like almost almost two years ago. You know, we've increased, we've had several hiring classes for our direct team. So I, 
you know, if we increase the size of the direct team by like 10% or something, it seems like generally in the ballpark. And then uh, we have added additional authorized partners, uh, mostly in the West Coast, where um, we just we just always kind of lacked a, a direct presence. Um, so yeah, and I, I think it's probably fair to say we'll continue to you know slowly add more headcount to our direct sales team just to account for Skytab demand. And you know, uh, as you think about the synergies we look for in M&A transactions, um, you know, the uh, the Rebel business had an awesome sales team, both direct and the series of partners. We're really excited to work with them. You know, as the transaction comes to a close. Yeah, great point. Great, thank you on both of those. Appreciate it. The next question is from Dan Dolo of Mizuho. Please proceed with your question. Hey guys, uh, thank you so much for taking my question. Uh, you know, great to see the organic uh, growth uh, reiteration for the year. Um, very, very strong. I have a quick question about Revel. You know, kind of, it's very interesting to see the acquisition. Uh, Jared and, and Taylor, can you maybe give us like a sense of the strategic rationale behind it and what you expect to get out of it? Thank you. Yeah, sure, Jared here. I'm, I'm happy to kick, it, kick this off. Um, yeah, th I mean, this is this is totally our playbook. I, I mean, this should be looked at very similarly to appetize or, or focus pause. I mean, you know, we can apply like all of our strategies to this. I mean, you know, first and foremost, um, you know, you have a massive payment cross sell. Uh, so, you know, if anyone's familiar with Rebels history, you know, it was valued once at over five hundred million dollars. We've, we've certainly announced a purchase price meaningfully less than that. Um, but it was an organization that intentionally overlooked payments for a very long time. It built, you know, really good software, won great customers, but payments was somewhat of an afterthought until the last, you know, couple of years. So, you know, instantly you, you have the ability to pursue existing customers, switch them over to payments. Second, you know, again, it's 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 kind of our SpaceX, uh, you know, philosophies that we've uh, adopted here of deleting the parts. You, you don't need two restaurant products. You're going to take the best capabilities out of out of Rebel for QSR and Enterprise and bring them over into into SkyTab, and you do that with a lot of talent that happens to be in the, you know, the same, it, 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 co-located essentially in the same area as our, uh, as our, our monster development team in, in Vilnius, Lithuania. And then you get a lot of distribution to sell a product that you know wins, that has a winning value proposition. Meaning, uh, as Taylor mentioned, Revel has a lot of salespeople direct already. They also have authorized partners in Europe uh, for their product as well. So, you know, you've got a massive cross-sell. You've got to take out the parts. Uh, so, you know, de delete du duplicative product offerings. Uh, you pick up a bunch of talent, and then you have a lot of distribution. You know, as Taylor mentioned, you know, we, we're just going through the standard kind of regulatory approval process. But, you know, assuming July 1 could very well be before that, you know, he said 15 million of EBITDA in the, in, the back half of the, in the back half of the year. You know, you annualize that. Uh, and that's with an acceleration ramp the following year. You, you can already get a sense that it was just a perfectly fine financial transaction on its own right. Yeah, Jared summarized that well. I, I don't have too much to add, except that we're excited, incredibly excited to get this one over the goal line, and don't expect it to be, you know, much much more than than July first, as Jared mentioned. Great, thank you. I, I definitely see it everywhere here in New York. So great acquisition, thank you. Our last question today will come from Sanjay Sakrani of KBW. Please proceed with your question. Thanks. Good morning. Um, I guess I have a question on SkyTab. I know it's early days, but maybe you could just help us think about the revenue contribution and how you see that developing over time and maybe also just the, the revenue potential of a SkyTap customer versus a non-SkyTap customer? Yeah, I'll start with this. Um, and I, I think it's important to dimensionalize kind of what our book looks like today. Um, SkyTap is exclusively focused on net new wins, um, adding customers. When we add a SkyTap unit, it is uh, you know overwhelmingly a customer that didn't exist in the ship or ecosystem prior to that. Uh, we also have the opportunity, uh, should we choose to, to kind of lean on it, to uh, upgrade customers that are on other pieces of restaurant software to SkyTab over time. We will get a SaaS lift from that, um, but these customers are typically already giving us payments. Um, and as you've seen, we try to price the SaaS offering in SkyTab to be you know, very attractive vis-a-vis -vis other competitors in the market. Um, we've seen lots of success um, as evidenced in kind of our earning materials and, and prepared remarks. Uh, you know, with this strategy, although we do think there's there's plenty of room to move price, uh, you know, when our nearest competitors, you know, brag about the number of modules they can they can sell to a customer and all of ours are, are included in our, our base pricing, you see the opportunity to to charge for it over time, although um, we're not seeing the need to do that in, in, in the current environment to, to attract a lot of customers. What you should expect from a SkyTab site just kind of at the macro level versus averages in our book is that the restaurants, they're typically a little bit smaller volume um, than what you'd have in an average hotel and significantly smaller than a stadium. Although we earn a higher spread and we earn a SaaS component on top of it. So very, very attractive 
customer in terms of the revenue contribution per uh, per dollar of volume. Nancy, I don't know if you want to give any more color than that. Yeah, I would just reiterate, you know, we said that SAS alone restaurant growth was 55%, you know, all within that is, you know, a very high percentage coming from SkyTab, well in excess of that. And, and I think it's just all the components that, you know, Taylor talked about, just the ramping. Um, we, I, I think the one thing you didn't talk about is just we don't charge for every enhancement right now and every um, module within within SkyTab. You know, it is. I would I, I would say it's not only is it a low cost um, competitively in the market um, offering, we also are generally giving one year free to many of our customers. So there's this ramp that you're going to see as we start la lapping um, SkyTab. That's going to have it's going to impact the back half of this year and certainly. Um, in the near term, you know, just 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 bigger revenue, bigger SaaS revenue. Um, just just great trajectory. Appreciate it. And just my my follow up, Jared, I appreciate all of the, the comments on the strategic review, but but maybe just help us think about, um, you know, sort of what valuation you think makes sense, you know, um, if you were to, to go down the path of, you know, a sale or, or we're just trying, I'm trying to dimensionalize um, sort of w what would get you excited and, and, and how we should think about um, the trajectory from here. You know, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a really tough question, right? Because um, I think there's a, a pretty big gap between, you know, how we, we are valued today and frankly, how we've been valued for, for quite some time, um, you know, relative to some of our, our, our high growth peers that don't even, you know, kind of share our profitability profile. Um, so I, I, I guess the thing I would point you to is, I mean, at the, you know, during the strategic review, I think almost, you know, every analyst put out a note. Um, you know, with where they thought, you know, ship four might, might, you know, transact at. Uh, and the rationale behind it. And, you know, I, I was like, I think, you know, generally, especially those on the higher end of it, we're, we're thinking things through correctly. Um, you know, but I, I think if you watch the evolution throughout that strategic review, those notes kept getting higher and higher. And I think, I think that was rightfully so, especially, you know, when you look under the hood at the, some of the things that are going on. Um, that certainly makes it hard for, I, I think, like, uh, you know, the strategic parties when, um, when there's a new note kind of every day in the direction it's going. But I, I didn't disagree that on the top end of the, some of those ranges that that would have been a more appropriate valuation, but certainly it's, you know, well, well above where we're at, you know, presently today. Okay, thank you. That's all the time we have for questions today. This concludes today's conference. You may disconnect your lines at this time.